Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Folks, we're in a process of letting people know about narrative-focused trauma care and the work of the Allender Center. And we do that. Yeah, let's just be quite clear. In some form, it's just a warm advertisement. But on the other hand, uh, what we get to do is play in the context of the glory of human lives and the glory of how Jesus shows up in the context of human lives. And today, uh, especially for me, I won't say less for you, Rachel, but for me, oh my gosh, this is just a very special experience. And to introduce Stacy Eldridge, uh, who is a New York Times best-selling authoress, and I could go through the books, many books, certainly beginning with Captivating. But I just have to say, though I've read all her work and certainly have deeply appreciated all your work, Stacy, Defiant Joy for me has been one of those books that at the time, such a necessary engagement with how my defiance was actually almost opposed to joy rather than indeed living out joy. So uh, it is a thrill to have you here and to say beyond all the gifting of heading up women's ministries that just one of the most amazing ministries in the world, Wild at Heart. Um, I'd also add, you know, you, you really are one of my best friends. And so the gift of having you on, that's just a very special gift, and especially given it's your day off, even more so. Thank you <laughs> for being with us. Oh, my goodness. It's an honor to be with you both. I'm with um, two people that I love. So, hooray. I love that we get to have a conversation <laughs> wherever it, wherever God leads it. Yeah. Well, let, let's just start with y- the relationship between you and Rachel. So, Rachel, just uh, uh, step in and begin to talk about um, this unique woman. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, I should name that Stacy Eldridge, for me, my introduction to you was certainly through your books in my teenage years and college years as an emerging young woman. Um, I had been a Christian for a long time, but um, was on my own journey of coming out of a really fundamentalist context where having a more emotional, love-filled, life-giving relationship with God had been lost a lot in some of the weeds of my spiritual formation. Though I would say my childhood spiritual formation, I was in a really lovely context that had like a wild kind of robust understanding of little kids' spirituality. Um, so that was my first encounter of you, but I had the profound privilege of uh, journeying with you through your experience of narrative-focused trauma care as a facilitator um, and was honestly quite nervous to meet you at first because I just felt like, oh, I want her to have an incredible experience. (laughs) And also anytime you are meeting like an author that's meant a lot to you, that that's how you know them. And you don't often get the privilege to get to experience more of their robust humanity. And one of the things I just so love about you is you are an incredibly playful person. Um, and you're so wise. And so like a deep well of a woman, but you also um, have an incredibly pr- playful presence that I just found so delightful. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, my, my turn to tell the story. <laughs> um, also, there are many groups in the NFTC program, but I had the best one um, <laughs> by far. I don't know. I didn't even talk to other people. I just know it. So uh, just to go back, like it's amazing to me that um, I'm just – that I got to – that you knew a little bit about me. I didn't even know that then. So that's awesome. Um, 
I am a woman who takes her healing really seriously. I I want I want to love others well. And I have bumped up against my own brokenness many times and then pursued Jesus in in different avenues of how can you meet me here? Or what about this? And I was on a walk. I remember it very well when Jesus said, I want you to do the program. Mm. And and I I was I was I was surprised and excited and a little scared because I knew it was gonna it was gonna require me going to some adept that I hadn't before and engage both the beauty and the tragedy of my own story. But my desire um, overcame my fear to follow his intention, also to remove any the block some more of the things in my own life that blocked me from believing and receiving mm-hmm. his love. Hmm. And I remember well going into our first time as a group, Rachel, and meeting everyone. And um, I'm actually still in still in relationship with a few of those people eight nine years later. Um, and they, you know, kind of were asked, why are you here? What made you choose to come? And all of them, because they wanted to love others better. They wanted to engage other people's stories. They wanted to serve them better. They were all outward focused. And it came to me and I said, yeah, I think other people are going to benefit, but I'm here for me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, again, that is so you. Again, the interplay between playfulness. Uh, My children still, I mentioned that we got to see one another recently to one of my children and Mm -hmm. immediately saying, I got to see John and Stacy. And immediately one of them said, I love the way they danced at Amanda's (laughs) wedding. (laughs) It's almost like all we have to do is mention your name and the next image is the wild, playful engagement in the midst of this really sweet time. But nobody, I mean, of all, I don't know how many people were there, a hundred people, um, n- nobody comes to mind with regard to dancing. It's not that you, it's not that I suspect you're the best dancers in the world, but maybe <laughs> they might second be or third, they, they might, might be. be. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that they sensed life, life, life mm. at its flooding, sweet river of life pouring forth. So when you ponder again the fact that you know there is life that comes in and through and with and for you and also that you know something of your own brokenness i'm sure a lot of people are going on well that mature of a woman can't be that broken and yet you have an honesty about your own brokenness that doesn't deny the life-giving presence but has that honesty i, I don't know if i have a question as much as i, I don't know where that takes you Oh my goodness. Um, honestly, it's too long of a story, but Jesus just came for me in the most profound way a month ago, uncovering and healing things that I didn't know I needed. We're, we're on a journey. And I think it's a great gift, not only to your own life, your own relationship with God, but your community, your relationships to, again, take it seriously, your, your healing. Um, it has such an effect on your your walk with God and your secret life with God is the greatest thing you have to offer anyone. So in order for that to flourish, you you want everything he has for you in the right time. So you know maybe maybe 20 years ago it wasn't the right time for me right. to to do the program. but when he said now, um, I knew it was the right time. And in fact, in knowing that we were going to have this conversation together, this you write, you do incredible amounts of reading that stretch my brain and my thoughts and my heart. And I will tell you that one of the books I literally threw across the room because it made me so mad. But you also have to write stories <laughs> engaging your own history. And I, I reviewed those 
today. Mm. Wow. And okay, so I wrote these a, a while ago, and um, it was incredible to reread them. And they are still true, and they still inform the woman that I am today. And they are still used to help me step into uh, who who I am to become. What did you learn from looking back? And what would? Oh my God! Well, I think it, just to say, especially for those of us who write, and I don't mean just write books, but but write. There there are times where I'll look back even six months, let alone a year or more, and be able to go, Wow, who who? Who was that person? Um, and yet, there's there's sometimes a conversation almost between m- me, who wrote, who was a different man even a year or two ago, versus the one reading. And that that dialogue can be troubling but fascinating. So I'm just curious, what what was the interaction between you and you? Well, uh, I I think in the process and looking back, it was such an invitation to be kind. Um, I, in my own evaluation of my life and my my way to um, live in the world, the way I needed to protect myself from harm, the way I engaged other people, in my own evaluation, I I was pretty harsh on myself with a, a lot of shame, a lot of judgment. And then to have the invitation to hold up a different lens to the story of my childhood, of a formative events, of what my parents were like, to name it, to name my place and my 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 story of origin, my family of origin, where I, all of it, all of it um, helped me be kind and offer myself mercy and not blame, but understanding and compassion. Um, some of it has shifted in in these last eight years and, and what I see, but not, not most of it. Um, and I, I think the revelation of honor, of honoring my own experience, honoring my own story, um, was profound. And this was one of the incredible things of having Rachel as the group leader amongst these other people who were in the, in a position of writing their own stories and sharing with vulnerability and honesty that sometimes blew me away. Their level of honesty it was such an invitation to take to be honest myself. And then to learn how to listen, how to attend to them. I remember um, Rachel saying once that the greatest gift you can give another person is your attention. So to actually not be distracted and focus in and and really listen was such a a gift. And when they would do that to me, um, it was amazing. There was there was a lot of Kleenex in that room. And and what <laughs> you also do is when you did it wrong. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> like, well, let me fix you, or let me tell you what I think is how you know. It was like, rant, rant. You just, it just fell. Like, there's a shift in the room, or when somebody would do it to me, it's like, nice try. Let's back up. Let's, let's try it out again. <laughs> so we were learning, and I love yeah. to call it play. Like, there was the freedom to learn in a safe environment. Yeah, yeah. I'm just laughing because. You know, that's part of my growth edge was as a facilitator because I have no poker face either. So like, yeah, when something fell, there was no like me, you know, some of my colleagues are much more graceful in tending to the moments where we're in a big growth moment. And I definitely am the person who's like, what did you just say? Like, can we take a step back? Like my face is such a truth teller for good and for ill. Oh, it's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> Something you said that I just, it made me think about, um, one, that gift of kindness. You know, kids, especially when we're bringing childhood stories, because kids are such great observers, but we're not, like when we're young, we don't have the luxury or the cognitive development to be, yes. you know, more 
thoughtful interpreters. And so, of course, so much of the ways we survive our worlds is we interpret in ways that are wrought with shame. And then, of well, course, we know we have an enemy that just takes that wound and wants to exacerbate it. Um, so I just there's something there um, about being able to offer kindness, a kind interpretation, a kinder yes. interpretation, but also just your sense of how stories they they remain our stories, but that they do evolve. Like there are certain stories I know I'll be telling for the rest of my life because they still hold like such deep meaning and more healing for me. And I think sometimes that's hard for people to, we don't like that because we want to kind of like, you know, get in, excavate, do the work and move on. Like there's such a temptation with healing in our healing journeys. And there's something about story work when we do have a posture of kindness and honor that is like you start to step into it and you go, oh, I'm going to be returning <laughs> to these memories and these moments again and again and again. And there will probably be new things for me to discover and to learn yeah. and to heal from. I bet you guys hear this a lot because in doing this, sometimes I would get hit with people saying, don't do it and get hit with mm -hmm. the scripture. The old has gone. The new has come turn face forward at, without an understanding of how you have to scoop, how you have to look back, how you have to scoop yeah. up and bring it along, yourself along. It, healing implies that there is something wrong from yesterday or the day before. A, a broken arm doesn't occur in the present in one sense, then to be healed, the, yes. the broken arm now has a future, but it has a past. And the implication of, I, I, I just had this experience as a very young believer of a, a, literally a friend that I got to know who had a broken arm, but because of his family, um, they refused to provide medical treatment. So he had learned, the, the bone had healed, and he had learned to adapt. And it became a metaphor for me, and I'm sure for many others, and because it's such an obvious one. He had learned to make his arm work in the way that it healed, but not well. Healed in a way that was not consistent with the designs of God. So we all have the capacity for this adaptive, quote unquote, appearance of healing that actually isn't healed. And one of the questions that had come in my young knowing of him was whether or not he was willing to go back to a physician who would break his arm again. Woof. And in one sense, it sounded like, oh, well, like he, he had a good life. He had learned to make the adaptation. And yet there were things, particularly because he had begun to play golf and he couldn't adapt. And so the question of like this somewhat silly sport, do I really want to come back into a season of long healing in order to do what my heart desires? And he made that choice. Uh, but what an agony to have to address a past that had not been addressed well, to now be addressed, to be able to give him a fundamentally different future. And I think that's the gambit that we're all in the middle of. How, how much do we really believe that Jesus wants not just good, but the best, the absolute best for us? And it's going often to require a return to, quote unquote, healing that's not healing in order to excavate, open the door, and begin a process that is meant to be so Oh my gosh, like at, at, at some points I just go, oh, let's do this. Let's do, and he's like, nope, 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 nope. You, you've got today. We'll, we'll, we'll speak about the days ahead and the days ahead. But the healing that is available today is so sweet and the cost great, but the glory better. The glory better so worth it so worth it I and mean, the invitation is always for the more i just can't help but ask i i'd, I'd love to hear how that because rachel here you are with again just a 
her star oh. person, her favorite person <laughs> ever in a group. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I, I, I'm wondering what you had to go through because here is a iconic presence uh, mm -hmm. used so deeply in the kingdom of God. And you're a younger woman, but I, I'll also say, in terms of my experience with both of you, both of you have this, oh my goodness, just deep sense of the unseen world. Uh, not only in terms of e evil's intent, but far more the reality of that winsome, oftentimes somewhat quiet, sometimes quite loud call into the presence of the goodness and glory of God. So both of you are, and again, language, uh, I, I, I would say mystics, um, women who listen well to the human heart, but listen even more to the heart of God. So I'm just curious about what the interaction was like between the two of you. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, um, because holding space for a group of people who are courageous enough and, you know, foolish in the best kind of way <laughs> to like step in with strangers they don't know and bring stories that they've likely not written down before this time. Or if they have, they've like done something in like a therapeutic setting or like a pastoral counseling or spiritual direction type setting, like maybe not group work. Um, you know, that's such a sacred honor. And I take it so seriously that in some ways, it's almost like as much as I, you know, was like, oh, gosh, like, <laughs> I just really want Stacy to have an amazing experience. And do I have the right gifts to offer that to her? The minute someone steps into that room, because, you know, if this was pre-COVID, so we actually did NFTC in person. Um, and I know we're going to have some opportunities to open up a hybrid opportunity in the future. But when someone entered that room, it was almost like we entered a different dimension. Yes. And I just felt a sense of this is your space. And my job as a facilitator is to hold this space with as much wisdom, like kindness, ferocity, <laughs> like, you know, that is granted to me so that whatever work Jesus wants to do with you, like I'm doing the work to be a good midwife in this moment with the spirit so that that work can happen. And I think the minute Stacy said that you said, I'm here for me, I thought, all right, we're going to be fine. Because I think my biggest concern for you was, would you have the freedom and permission in your own self, especially in a group of people who might be aware of who you are, We've to like in. it get to be your space? And there was something about that declaration that I think invited our group to also be like, all right, like we can commit to that too. And, um, and so again, there, yeah, there's something that happens when it's like, a, a, it's a, in the best kind of way, a, a leveling, a level playing field. Yes. Right. Even as a facilitator, I love when the spirit is moving through someone else and saying the thing that maybe I've even been trying to say, but the way they say it is received by the person who needs to hear it. And it's just, there's so much you learn. And so I just felt like a, such a privilege and I just took it very seriously because I know that you are someone who's often pouring out to others and that's what you're called to do. And that's a part of how you're gifted. And so to get to be someone holding a space for you to get to be poured into and receive care just felt like a privilege of a lifetime. And I feel that with every person um, who says, I'll entrust my story to you for a yes. season. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. okay, privilege yeah. of a lifetime. Yeah. It's so bully. And curious for you, you, Stacy, and again, I already know the answer, but I, I can't, I can't help but ask. That you're sitting with a younger woman who you probably sense has uh, some of her own unique eccentricities. <laughs> um, but what you agree, right, Rachel? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I know I'm weird. It's cool. <laughs> so, given that, like, uh, I'm just curious if you remember what it was like in those first encounters with her. I do. Rachel has uh, a weightiness in the spirit. So there was never um, there was never any feeling of she's a younger woman, maybe she's not uh, she, and it felt like she was ahead of me. 
And she had completely everything that she needed for me to rest in into being in that group and trusting. And there were there was particularly one woman who I really liked as well in that group who was a little eh, when I came in the room because I she knew who I was and I had meant something to her. And that was dispelled like in the first 15 minutes because because I wasn't there as a teacher or an author or a speaker or here let me I, I I'm here alongside to to share and to walk along and go with it with whatever Jesus has for us because that's why we're here we're willing to be incredibly vulnerable and go wherever he leads us which meant going back to pain going back to tragedy and 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 sitting in that sacred terrain of one another's stories. And Rachel held it all so well. I trusted her implicitly. I, I mean, immediately. Just trusted her implicitly. There was never any doubt in my mind. There was never. I just, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love you, Rachel. You forever <laughs> hold it in my heart because of, of what I got to journey with you for that year. Well, the interplay of how humility has to be present in order to invite engagement and care, let alone truth and kindness. Yet the intersection between humility, that is, I am desperate, doesn't feel like, but in fact is such phenomenal courage to indeed, in one sense, step well outside of the realm of, uh, of again, comfortability, and that choice to open your heart very humble, incredibly courageous. But I think for many people, in the humility and at one level desperation for more of the work, more of the healing of God, we sometimes don't feel or sense or even postdictively look back and say, that was incredibly courageous. So uh, I'm just curious, uh, Stacey, how, how you would name your own courage. Um, you know what? I applaud my ability and desire to jump in with both feet. Um, no, I was I wasn't there, and I didn't. Go I'm very serious about my own healing too. <laughs> like I want everything. So um, I knew it was a confidential group. I could come with with the mess, and um, and know that I was being shepherded. Well, so it it it, it was a risk. It, it was courageous, and and I bless that. And it is very vulnerable. Like you know, beforehand, during, after, you need a little bit of you need a little you need care, you just to do it. And I know, for me, I would really like if life had just stopped, if everything else yeah. had been. Just y'all take care of yourself while I'm I'm doing this, but it ended up for me being unbelievable, like life altering tragedies around me in my closest relationships during it, mm -hmm. and so I look at it and I wonder, what what was it like for me to be there in the midst of that? And my last engagement with Rachel was with tears just streaming down my face, and her just with tears as well. And what a gift that is. So, I mean, courage is with heart. You know, live with courage. Live with your heart. Um, that you can live without it, but but why? Your life is worth living and you need your heart with it. So I, I, that would encourage other people to, to, in safe places, with wisdom, risk. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you had a very unusual um, co-participant in that group. Am I correct? I or am I forgetting? I may be forgetting. In my in my, I'm not sure. Not, not Rachel's in your, yeah, not in your group group, but in the larger domain of the people who are there, the the larger group. Am I forgetting? I if, if, if so, will are you we'll talking about my husband showing up? No, I'm talking about your son. My son. No, my son did not show up during the group. 
Oh, he not the did group. It, though. Sam did go through the NFTC program either the next year or the following year. Okay, well then I am indeed. But let's just keep <laughs> on going and go. Well, what was it like having Sam go through? I mean, mother, son, maybe not at the same time, which I thought in my own little imagination. I remember you both being in the same group, but no, not group group, but in the large group. But what do you call it? Later. Cohort. 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 <laughs> yes. That's the word. <laughs> we found it. We found it. Well, it's been a, it was amazing having him do it because I knew what he was doing. First off, you know, he didn't have to buy all the books. That was really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> See? Very playful. Yeah. And yeah. frugal. And he, did, yeah. and he did want to know which one I threw across the room. So I let him guess. And then what happened was in our own dynamics, I knew the stories and he was curious about my stories. And I would not share all of them with him, but there was one that I would. And um, and because of his own going through this with you guys, he 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 sought me mid speaking and asked, "How old do you feel right now, Mom?" Oh. And I said, "Twelve. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so perceptive?" But he did. He didn't. Ask, I mean, it was with such kindness. Um. So him understanding, him going through it, us having this kind of same framework and language and shared experience has, has been amazing. Well, and that kind of leads me to a couple of questions I have. You can choose your own adventure, but it's kind of circling back to what you named about some people saying, like, don't do it. Like nothing good can come from bringing up the past. Like God's making you new. And it just makes me one that I totally get how people have in some ways, the broken bone metaphor, like that's how they've been okay with in some ways yeah. feeling like God doesn't care about the heartache or maybe God won't show up in the ways that we most desperately long for. But I would be so curious, yeah, like how did engaging painful stories in your life, did it, maybe not how it did it, but did it shift anything in your relationship with God? Um, oh. And did it shift how you were able to be with other people in tragedy? That's the question, isn't it, Rachel? Uh, and the answer is yes. I like, uh, I use the ana that analogy of the broken arm is amazing. What I will use is this, the event didn't change in my past. When I look at it or write a story about it or share it with someone else, but get new insight, it, it still happens. And, and for some of the hard stories that we're looking at, death entered in and something, something died. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jesus came and he enters into that story and it still happened, but the sting of death is removed. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer something that cripples me or that I have to be ashamed of. But it's something that, again, offer compassion and understanding to my own life. And also sometimes go, I don't have to operate the same way any longer. That's right. I see how I've been acting in a self-protective way out of fear. And in that, withholding love and care from others. And the invitation, to, no, you're actually, you can be well there. And, I, and, and Jesus can enter into that. The sting of death can be removed. And then... The hope that I can offer people in in that space of you, there's there's more, and we don't have to do a cycle of repeat. We don't have to continue suffering um, from wounds that we received in our past. And so, I love what it has done in my encouraging other people to risk engaging. And go where God is leading. It may not be just like, look at everything. No, no, it's a particular. Walk with him with what he's revealing, where he wants you to go. Because there is life to be had. There is the resurrection from the dead. There is more available. So, yeah, I, I you know, shout that from the mountaintops. That's the hope of the gospel <laughs> right now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. With that freedom to desire, with it, again the humility of knowing, I I know Jesus so much better today 
than I did, I think, even about a week ago. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, <sighs> and yet, each and every moment holds something of this delicious, almost hors d'oeuvre delicious sense of, if the hors d'oeuvres are this good, <laughs> what, what must the meal be like? That's just ahead. And that so choice not to like come to some either arrogant assumption, I'm good. Or what's more true for me is I, I'm not sure I believe that there could be more on my behalf. And mm -hmm. to wrestle with the interplay both of fear and arrogance, uh, and then to be able to say, no, I'm, I'm certainly not wanting to give in to fear, and no more so into arrogance, and to be able then to be disposed to receive, uh, gives such a freedom then to be able to give, and that's that's some of the play that uh, you know. Again, we won't account for I don't know how many trips, vacations, times together, but uh, I'll just say that. I would not be the man I am without you, Stacey. Oh, nor, nor me the woman I am. I'm immensely grateful. You're persistent, passionate, playful, disruptive, so kind. It's one of those remarkable gifts of a lifetime to have your presence and wisdom. And I know that's the case for so many others, which I celebrate. And that's in part where, you know, that whole strange reality of, I, you didn't plan this. This wasn't something that was in your vocational thoughts as probably a 17 and 18 year old. Um, but at least to be able to say, in, in the broadest words, What's the trajectory that you would see your life being? When you think about your presence on the earth, um, how do you reflect uh, on your remarkable presence? Okay, I'm absolutely going to answer that question. I'm going to buy time for my mind to work by getting an opportunity to say <laughs> to all these people, but Dan, you bring tears to my eyes with what with what you just said. Like, what an incredible! I mean, I it's hard to believe that. I mean, t humility, honor that I got to play a role in your life, in Becky's life. When I am so on the receiving end of your deep walk with God, your unique way, your brilliance. Like, I could go on, and one day I will, and there will come a day when you will get to hear it from everyone in the celebration, I will be in the front row. <laughs> so there, I got to say that. The, the trajectory, how do I see the trajectory of my life? You know, it's really, um, it's really tempting to go, okay, I'm going to be 65 this year. And the world would say to me, time to mm. pull into the cul-de-sac and garden and perfect your muffin making. And you know what? I love to garden and I plan on stealing my grandchildren's hearts with my baking ability. So right. nothing, <laughs> none of that is, is not good. But the part that isn't good is saying I'm sidelined now when that is not the case in the kingdom of God. And um, as you know, I'm kind of loving Psalm 92 right now, where it says, like, in their old age, they're going to bear fruit. Their leaves are going to be green. So I am, I am actually curious about what God has for me. And in my work here at Wild at Heart, I'm actually stepping into more responsibility. We're expanding our women's ministry. I'm excited for what the future is holding, and it, it is, it is. The doors are wide and neat there. Um, God is asking me to write. I'm kind of, kind of, you know, been a little disobedient, let's say, because He's been asking me to write a particular thing, and I'm yielding again. So, what I want the trajectory of my life to be is to continue to know Jesus so deeply 
that, that um, we share a union and oneness that at this point in my life, I didn't even know was possible. Mm-hmm. I want to step more and more and more into that with every breath that I take and then offer others to allure them to his beautiful heart and his expansive love that we will never know the, the end of. So let mm-hmm. that be the trajectory of my life. Oh, glory be. And I, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, Rachel, but all, all I would wish to add is I have seen a privilege, you know, where you we go. I don't know how I ever came to deserve a front row seat, uh, but I've got one. And I get to see that trajectory and the, you know, do you know the word contrails, the the the, the, the vapors that yes. come from behind? <laughs> and it's like, uh, I don't just see the contrails. I get to be pretty near that. We're in that plane as it, as it spreads the mark of its glory. And, you know, in, in all that, I, I just go, we, we need one another. We need to have people, I need people like you to be able for my own heart to say, oh, I want to be like this woman. And to have mutuality in that process of, I want to be like you. No, I want to be like you. It's not envy. It's the honor with gratitude of admiration that comes because you see the living presence of Jesus. That's what community is meant to be. Yes. One of my favorite things you've said is, I take my healing really seriously. And I just, I think um, I see a testament to that, even in how you hold to the trajectory of what's possible for the season ahead. And as a woman entering my 40s, who already feels like maybe it's time for me to retire, um, <laughs> I I just find great hope in that, that there's there's a lot of life, God willing, left. And there's a lot of healing possibility left. There's no demand but there's opportunity. And I like that nature of being allured to the love of God that we don't, we will never see the end of um, in this season of life. That, that, that is very compelling to me. So thank you. Yay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Mm-hmm.